Great. Welcome to part two of class five of uh, Glow in Color. And we are going to be having a lot of fun, hopefully, the next couple hours here. We're going to be getting Monet on this painting. Uh, so I put up a number of different Monet references on the uh, Padlet. You get to choose or make up your own or whatever you like. I um, The references are mostly square format, but I wanted to paint onto a 16 inch by 20 inch, partly because I have this really cool old antique frame. So just in case this works out, I thought it would look nice. And uh, since I'm not selling it, maybe it'll be a fun one to have in my studio. That's being a little cocky there and thinking that it's actually going to work out. But um, I so what I did was I took the Monet reference and I altered it from its square format by stretching it a little bit tall ways. And then I also cropped some of the uh, cropped it a little bit. Um, and also I noticed that the horizon line was smack dab in the middle and uh, I didn't want that. So I changed the horizon line slightly. Um, but that's just so you guys uh, know when you get to the painting. So my trees will be a little taller than Monet's nice little squat uh, willow trees there. Mine will be a little bit taller willow trees. So really quickly, the reference that I chose, you can see I just kind of stretched it out, made it a little bit taller. Um, this one's got a lot of blues, greens. I'm going to try to hide some pinks and different reds, burgundies in there a little bit. Um, I really like the sky color. It's one of my favorite colors in paintings is kind of the uh, salmon-y, peachy color. Um, I was initially going to do the dark one with the more purples and uh, warmer sky, but I thought this is uh, different for me. I don't do a lot of blues and greens in my paintings. They tend to get pretty warm. Lots of reds and yellows, so I thought this would be a good challenge for me. Michael, um, on your on the painting with all the cattails, it that looks like so smooth, not a brush stroke in it. Right. And, and is that is that right? Yeah, I mean, in the grasses and stuff, there's quite a bit of texture, but. Um, in the background, I definitely brushed that out with a soft brush because I really wanted the texture to help come forward. So when we get into painting this and bring everything else out, I actually show you the very first one I did was it's from a little there's a little beaver pond, and this was a plain air painting um, I did of and when the cattails are blooming, they have that really nice cottony um, yeah. seeds that they put out. Yeah. Sure, it's hard to see. Um, and I just loved it. So I've done a number of them. I just revisit it. It's only about three blocks from here. So my wife and I, when we go for our walks, a lot of times I'll convince her to go walk down by them and get more photos and stuff. Um, but I really wanted this one to be, um, to make the background where it's almost invisible. You can kind of tell that it, hopefully that looks like light catching some fog and then reflecting in the water right on the edge. Yeah. But I almost want the background to be abstract. And then it's when I put in all the texture and detail. So this will get pretty brushy. But yes, the background is very smoothed yeah. out. Did you use the medium or just um, to get it that smooth or just your brush? There is a tiny bit of medium in there, a little bit of a, a um, Galkid gel, which I think really helps to smooth it out. It makes it dry a little faster. And um, but it does add shine to it. So I have to be aware of that. Uh, uh, okay. But then I can go through and just put a, a uh, matte um, varnish over the top of that, which I like to do. Do you varnish all your paintings? Try to, just to protect them a little more and equalize the shines. Otherwise you get shiny spots and you know dull spots. There did my, where did my T-square go? There it is. So I just want to put in my horizon line first. That's pretty much my rule to myself. Um, so I know it's 20 inches tall and it's a little over halfway. So if I kind of go, okay, here's my 10 inches. 
I want it to be, I don't want my horizon line right in the middle. I'm going to lower it down about two inches. So right about there. I'm going to be doing a lot of my drawing with my, my knocker down. So I definitely could have and probably would have done this as a wipe away painting, but I kind of felt like I should jump back and show you guys a little bit of um, just kind of more of the drawing, kind of more of the cartooning method um, and filling that in in big shapes. So I've got my top of my trees over here. And you kind of over there, you come down across the top, kind of cut in, and the base of this foreground tree is all the way about here. It's kind of a big light shape here. And I'm using a very different type of brush, really long bristles. Um, I don't use this very much, but it's fun for drawing with, and I'm just gonna kind of get my big important shapes in. You can see I'm already changing my mind, drawing and then redrawing. I can simply just take my paper towel with a little bit of paint thinner, just a touch, and I can, you know, make sure I'm not following the wrong lines. And because it's going to get all nice and thick paint, I don't really care about what's underneath it a little bit because it's all going to get covered. Since since you're going to be using the cooler or the blues and green colors anyway, why did you? draw with that color good Just... question um i like quinacridone red partly because it blends in pretty well with pretty much every other color for some reason it doesn't make muddy too much but you're right i could have absolutely done purple or blue or whatever else i mean maybe maybe i should actually mix a little manganese um, but oftentimes when i'm doing the sketching method i sketch with the quinacridone um a lot of my good friends, like Eric Jacobson, tends to sketch with purples a lot. Just kind of mixes a, a little bit of his manganese and um, and uh, quinacridone. Um, but uh, yeah, I don't. I just find that it just doesn't get as muddy. And I'm already as I putting it down with the purples, it gets a little bit dark feeling for me. I'm going to lower this shape here. Michael, are you using oils or acrylics? Uh, oils, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, these will all be oils. It would be a fun one to do with acrylics if I was an acrylic painter. Michael, what is the light blue color on the end to the right? Oh, okay. good question. Thank you. I was going to mention the colors, but that is cobalt teal. I'll go through here and cobalt list the colors uh, as I'm getting started here in just a second. What a mess the sketch is. Thank goodness nobody will ever see it. But it's just for me and you. Hey, see. Michael, is that the transparent Quinoc or is that permanent? The, oh, uh, Quinacridone. It's just uh, Quinacridone red. Oh, okay. But, I, but they're, all, they're all pretty transparent. I think you might be thinking of a lizard and crimson. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you're right. I'm all mixed up. 
Oh, that's all right. All right. I can come in and you know make all the different trees, but I don't really need to um, because I'm going to be building those up as I'm going. But yeah, nice and just messy, loose. This is a very organic scene. So I really, I mean, unless somebody's a real big fan of Monet, which they'd already know I stretched it out and cropped it off and changed things already just to make it fit onto my surface. Um, but I don't really care too, too, too much about um, everything being perfect here. I'm going to have fun with the color and the mixing and everything else. So we got a couple more pieces of tape so we can straighten that paper out. So I like to typically work from big shapes to small shapes, dark to light, and thinner paint to thicker paint. That just seems to be the way that putting on the oil paints works the best for me. Um, so that being said, I'm going to work from big shapes to small shapes, which are Big, I got big blue shapes. I've got big green shapes on the left side here. And then I've got my big sky colors. Um, trying to decide if I should work more with some of these blues first or if I should come into the big darks first. I'm going to go ahead and establish my real darks in this green area first. So I'm going to mix a big pile of dark. It's mostly ultramarine, touch of my um, cadmium red. When I mix those two together, I'll get a hideous, plummy, dark, purpley color. I probably am not going to need a whole lot of dark, dark plum in this, even though a dark, a warm dark might be really nice because it's such a cool painting. but I will add a little bit of my cool lemon yellow, which in my case is the Hansa yellow light to it to neutralize that purple. There we go. I'm gonna let some of that go towards the greens, but they're kind of a, a warm green. I'm making sure I remember to add some of the yellow. I'm looking towards the values, the lights and the darks, as well as the colors as I'm kind of mixing up some of my big piles here. I don't paint with the uh, cobalt teal hardly ever. So I'm kind of curious what direction that's going to send my colors and what it will do. But the reason I grabbed it today when I note normally is because it's quite opaque and it has a good coverage. Otherwise, I have two blues that are very transparent. Um, the ultramarine and the manganese blue hue are both quite transparent. So when painting, you know, a kind of an impressionistic style, a lot of times you do want more opacity. So I can either use my transparent paints thickly, which is going to be expensive, more expensive, or I can use just more opaque paints. Um, so I got my cadmium red medium here, which is a very good coverage, very opaque. Let me just go through the colors real quick. I've got titanium white, which is pretty much the white I always use. I've got Hansa yellow light. This may have been a good opportunity to use the cadmium yellow light or a lemon yellow, cadmium lemon. Because again of its coverage, the Hansa yellow is a semi opaque, I think. Um, but it's a little bit more transparent than the cadmiums. 
Uh, I've got lemon yellow just to warm up my yellows if I need to. Um, I won't be painting with it too, too much uh, pure because it's so transparent, but it's going to work nice to warm up areas of my sky as well as to make some of the uh, greens in here feel a little bit warmer. Did um, you say lemon yellow? If I had, if I, I sure could have used the lemon yellow instead because it's no, going to have better coverage. I thought you I'm sorry, I thought you said, um, can you say the two color names again, the yellows that you have? Yeah, Hansa Yellow Light is what I'm using, but a lemon yellow would be probably better today. Um, and then I've got my uh, Indian yellow. I may have said lemon yellow, but I meant to say Indian yellow. Um, cadmium Red Light. Um, quinacridone Red. And with this painting, a quinacridone magenta may have been really nice because it's a cool, even cooler of a red than that, but um, I grabbed this. I've got ultramarine blue. Uh, I've got my manganese blue hue. Again, both very transparent. So I went ahead and added an opaque blue, which is the cobalt teal. Um, again, that will be, hopefully it works, uh, a little bit of experimentation um, with that color. But it's Monet, so you know I can have a lot of fun. Um, so yeah, still working in here. Let's see what happens if I lighten these up with a, 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 my opaque, ooh, beautiful color. Just got to figure out how to use that. Lovely, lovely, lovely. Let's see what happens when I send it to green. Now that pile of paint also is it the same as the first color mix? A it's little bit. It's got some of that, but now I'm slowly changing it out with uh, with some more of the uh, cobalt teal. That's beautiful. Ooh. Just to see, yeah, it's a little vibrant, but you know that's my that's my own problem. Scared of vibrant colors. All right, I like that. I like this color palette here. That's going to be what's going to cover most of this. But I'm going to come in with purples and maroons and different things to introduce more color into this area. Now I'm going to jump to the back, these blues that are back here, and see what uh, how I want to mix those. So I'm going to start with my, I'm going to start with, I squint my eyes, it looks more ultramarine to me than the manganese, but it's definitely going to have some manganese in it. And I'm going to go ahead and introduce some of the teal right away and just see. So that's all three of my blues. Let's just see what happens. Um, also with a slightly dirty, whew, Beautiful, but very strong. That is really a high chroma, almost a, almost just a nice cobalt blue, which is gorgeous, but not the color I'm going to be needing, I don't think. Let's mix some white with it, because it is definitely a lighter value than this blue. So what happens if I mix some white into it? Lovely. But again, not quite the right color that I want. So I'm going to send this towards green just a touch. Let's start with the cobalt, just since it's such an interesting color. And let's see what happens when we mix some cobalt into that. And then I'll start introducing yellows and reds to see if that does what we might want. Michael, I'm sorry to back you up, but that, that large... Uh, the darkest color that you have on your palette is ultramarine and what? And cad red medium or cad red light, sorry. And just a touch of the Hansi yellow. Thanks. Yep, no problem. Yeah, that's very typically that when I'm using my split primary palette, my black is very typically made with like two third or three fourths ultramarine blue, a touch of the um, cadmium, uh, whichever the warmest red is and just a touch of my uh, lightest yellow. So what you're doing is making a hideous purple, and then you're going to neutralize that purple by adding a touch of yellow to it. Oops, I already know I added too much yellow. So before I mixed it into the whole pile, I pull it away. So is that is that considered your black? Yeah, or my dark. But I mean, yeah, if you want, if you thought I needed a black on my palette, then yeah, it could be my black. But the good thing about it is, is I almost never need black in any painting. 
like I almost don't see a, a black area, like a shadow that's so strong that it would benefit from just being black. Um, generally, there's some color in there. And so the nice thing about when you're mixing your own darks is it forces you to kind of ask what is happening? And if it is black, what could be happening in there? I know that it's the shadow of a big, dark um, weeping willow tree hanging out over a river. So what could be happening in there? Is it reflecting light from the water in there? Is, you know, what things are happening? I'm liking this blue. It's definitely gone a lot more gray. And I'm feeling much better about it. In fact, I almost don't tell Monet, but I almost like it a little better than the color I'm seeing in this bad print of a bad photo of a Monet painting. Really like that. In that, I know we're gonna have some purples. So I'm gonna introduce a little quinacridone and see what that does with the color. Slightly darkens it. You uh, just we'll added more ultramarine blue to the uh, blue mix. I did, and now I'm changing that to, or adding quinacridone uh, to see about getting some purples in there. I guess I can move this in front of you guys so you can actually see what's going on here. So now I'm just kind of looking in this back area here and experimenting with colors to see what I can get away with. I don't know why I always say it like that, what I can get away with, but what can the painting handle? What will help it? I almost knew I would end up with getting some of these purples and I love that. And I think that's gonna play so beautifully against some of these greens over here. Yeah, it's gonna look really nicely together. So having that kind of in the background, how did you get the purple, blue, and? Uh, just a bit of my quinacrid out there. Okay. If I mixed it with the other red, it would get really brown because there's quite a bit of green in this. So it'll make a pretty ugly, it wouldn't make a true purple, it'd make kind of more of a brown. Yeah. But by using the manganese instead, or the quinacridone, sorry, it uh, stays oh. nice and vibrant, and I don't have the yellow being introduced as much in the red. There. I'm just going to try and make a little bit of uh, green that will go over the tops of some of this. Here, I'm using the same colors because I want them to relate. And you can, I, I don't know if you can see it in the reference, but the green is not very vibrant back there. It's just kind of barely lit up in the foregrounds of these trees. I should definitely be mixing more paint since I'm making a big Monet painting, but let's just get it covered and then uh, I'll start building up as we go. Um, yeah, I'm just gonna go ahead and start with that. Maybe a little too fast, we'll see. Um, I also grabbed some crazy brushes for this. Um, so these are just super long, um, kind of an Egbert style brush. And I just really like how much movement and bend I can get in them. Um, I'll probably be using those as I build up. But first, I'm just going to get these big shapes kind of covered. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and again, doing dark to light, big to small, and thin to thick. So I'm just going to get these things in there, my big shapes. And then I'm going to show you that we can paint um that we can paint wet into wet we don't have to let our painting completely dry I'm adding just a touch of paint thinner so i can move this around you know it doesn't look like i'm very monet style right now because it's very uh thin and washy but i'm just kind of figuring out my shadow structure What did you say? Dark to light, thin to thick, and what? Big to small. Oh, yeah. Okay. 
Wow, I love that blue mix at the top on the left. Right, and that's a little bit of the transparency of the um, of the ultramarine paint kind of coming through. And I might be able to let some of that show through in some of the shadows, because again, I like to leave my shadows a little bit thinner paint just so they're not so shiny. What you say is Bible verses. If you know what I mean, I need to write them all down. What? I didn't <laughs> quite hear you, maybe. I said, every word you say is like a Bible verse. I need to write it down. Uh oh. <laughs> Gonna get me in trouble. No. <laughs> Isn't that just weird, right? I mean, talk about just abstract. I'm just looking for just the structure of some of these shadows that are in here. Then I can go ahead and start getting to the light because I want to build my big shapes up. And I'm going to come back in and I'm going to add beautiful, thick, juicy paint on top of this. So don't worry. I want to get this painting covered. I want to, I want to get started. I want to begin to compare my shapes and my values to each other, my colors, my temperatures, so that I can begin to read it. And that way I can begin to play and experiment. So I just kind of got to know where I'm at, who's relating to who, who's playing with who, what colors are doing what. But already the transparency in some of these, like look at the transition in here of those transparent kind of colors. And by moving my, um, by squishing the uh, cobalt teal and making it so thin on the surface, it's uh, sure making some nice colors, nice transitions, at least in my opinion. This is exciting to see how when you laying the colors on the canvas, how the transitions in the brush strokes even makes the colors come through from the canvas, from the board. Yeah, a little bit. I mean, it's big and it's mushy and it's, you know, yeah. it definitely does not look like a, a Monet painting or a big Impressionist painting. And I, I can't tell you that this is, you know, how Monet would have done this exactly, but it's how I would do my impersonation of a Monet painting. Um, and not even how I would do it every time, um, just how I'm doing it this time. And that's so, to say that, you know what, it's better just to paint. You, you know, we don't have to have everything figured out. Just kind of attack it, have fun, learn from it. I looked up this particular painting. He did 15 of them. He made, oh, he, converted, really? he converted a boat into a floating studio and then would line up all the uh, canvases on easels in a studio to complete them as a series. Oh, so, so you're saying that's how Monet did this? Yes. Oh, that's he, so good. I, I literally meant to look up and figure out the story. So he, his friend had a boat. And he, he, just, converted, he converted a boat into a floating studio. Oh, very cool. He put he a roof over it. He put a roof over it. Yeah, if anybody uh, finds a photo of that and posts it to our Padlet, extra credit for you. We'd love to see that. But yeah, what a what a guy. I think I have a picture of him in the big book I have on his paintings in his boat. It, it talked all about how he converted this boat into a, a studio, like she was saying, and he, he just put a roof on it so he could not have the glare of the sun on his work. Very nice, yeah. Um, again, this is just a really bad print of probably a bad photo. Um, so I'm, you know, I'm, especially in the shadow areas, I, I know that Monet didn't have such just big areas that appear kind of blackish. So I'm, you know, I'm, I'm picking out like, okay, you know, where 
the lights hitting the water and reflecting back up in. I'm just assuming, you know, because I've seen, I've been sitting at the creek side a lot. I, uh, you know, paint a lot of water. I, I try to observe from nature um, that a lot of times the shadows underneath are actually getting warmed back up. Um, kind of a beautiful thing. So I'm kind of adding a little bits of purpley little warmth into there, but it's still staying nice and dark. Um, let me just go ahead and clean up this area and let's get to the background trees. So my goal is kind of going to be to like get this whole surface covered in about a half hour so that I can get into the fun part, even though I'm having a blast right now. Don't worry. But the more fun part. I, I have it kind of shrunk down a bit and it looks really pretty as if you're stand if you took some steps back at just those colors. It looks so pretty. I really, yeah, it's got a kind of nice cool emeraldy tone to it right now. But don't let me fall in love with it yet. I gotta be willing to go crazy. That color is really a lot brighter than I had intended. Um, it's reading much more exciting than I had initially intended. So I may have to, I'm just going to put a little bit of it in and see if I can't use some of that. And then I'm going to have to come in. Wow, it's really, that is so cobalty. <laughs> I don't know what the color is. Um, but maybe, 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 maybe we'll get away with it. If there was ever an opportunity to get some crazy colors in, this is it. So maybe I'll put it in and then cover most of it up. Again, I'm just using Monet's painting here as kind of a springboard, making my own Monet. Add a little more purple to that batch. Definitely did not mix enough color. Yeah, lovely colors, but they just don't read as realistic at all. It reads like a Mediterranean sea, not a bunch of trees. A smarter me would slow down and remix a nice pile, but the dumb me right now just wants to keep attacking this surface and at least getting it covered. So when you're painting, be the smart me and not the dumb me. Take your time, step back, remix your piles a little bit, make sure they're relating. Just getting it covered so I can begin to compare my values, my lights and my darks, my colors, my chroma, seeing if they're right. And I already know some of them are wrong, especially right here. It feels really awkward to me, even though it's a lovely color. It's not the right color, probably. Um, that color was cobalt, cobalt teal. Manganese blue and ultramarine. Yeah, and then just a Plus little white. bit of yellow. Probably okay. could have used, probably could have benefited from a little more, white. a little more red and a little more yellow just to neutralize it so it's not so, so electric, right? We can neutralize our colors by mixing from across the color wheel. So with the blues, I would probably want to introduce a little bit of orange to neutralize those, which would be my red and my yellow.
<laughs> yeah, this is just killing me. So I got to do something about that. So I'm going to introduce quinacridone into there. Make them too ugly of a color. All right, I think this is going to work. So I'm basically just introducing little bits of it into those areas. And then I'm going to wipe off because I've got a huge amount of it on there. And I can see that that ugly color that I'm introducing there, that kind of plummy gray brown that I just added. And now I can just kind of mix that in. And it should neutralize. Yeah, good. Bring that color down to uh, where it doesn't make my heart palpitate when I look at it too much. Did unfortunately make the color a little darker than I probably want it. So we'll have to keep that in mind when I'm coming back in and adding my color on top. So that's manganese and manganese and quinacridone there. Pretty vibrant pink. Let's add a little of the cobalt teal and see what that does. Hmm. Let's see here. Just kind of creating a barrier color between the bluey green of these trees and i'm going to int start introducing some sky which is going to be pinks salmon colors and yellows and i don't want them to get too muddy where they connect so i'm creating again a barrier color of purples so it'll be a transition from the bluey greens and i'm hoping it'll do some optical mixing soften my edges, helping to push these trees back optically a little bit. Also introducing some texture. It's gonna be weird if I end up painting a painting so colorful that it would make Monet blush. And that guy, you know, is not afraid to throw some pigment down get some nice high chroma things but this at least for me you know i like the earthy colors and the grays and the browns and everything else this feels so incredibly vibrant so for some of you this might be just right in your wheelhouse just you're much more comfortable with color hi michael you, you use that um transition color because you you, I mean, you're calling it a transition color because it's going to move into a, a pinker sky, or yeah. why? Why? Uh, just well, because I'm softening the edges because it's you know not a crisp, crisp, crisp day. You know, it's got a, got some atmosphere in there, and so the edges of things that are further away are going to feel softer. And so to make them feel soft, I could simply blur them, but I can also work with the colors and, um, and do transitions from the bluey greens to the pinks of the sky or pinky orangey colors of the sky. I need something, otherwise it's gonna be a huge jump. And then the areas in between will turn brown where they blend. So by making the transition color myself, and putting it down, I'm allowing the eye to skim across 
and um and also my colors will stay purer does that make sense so if i let my greens of my trees touch the oranges of the sky the salmon colors of the sky green and orange you know are going to make some weird brownie colors and i also just kind of see it in monet's paintings and kind of one of my favorite things to paint is kind of those transition colors where you kind of get that aura of glow around a thing. So that may be what attracted me to this picture in the first place. Do you only do that in the transition from a landscape to the sky or do you do that with your other like a forward moving a forward bush or uh, I can do it anywhere I would like or wherever I think that it can be happening because it could definitely be happening closer up. And I mean, down here, it's going to be in the water, but of course it's a reflection of the, of the sky. So that makes sense. Um, yeah. And let's just see how that works here. Um, I kind of like it. Do you, how does that feel having that kind of pinky color kind of around there? Doesn't it feel like it kind of blends out a little better optically? Yes. I like it. Works. Yeah. 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 So yeah, I'm just kind of looking for, you know, Monet left clues for me in his paintings, even though it's a bad print of a bad photo, you know, of a beautiful painting. Um, he still, you know, he still leaves clues in there of things that I can at least experiment with and see how it plays. I can always come back in. Um, all right, now, we, I mean, we're getting it covered quick, Lee. Go ahead and clean that brush. It's a good size for the sky. I wish I could see the colors in the sky better. It's a pretty bleached out photo, but I am going to say that it is. Quite orange. But definitely not this. That would be crazy. Um, and I shouldn't probably be using this brush to mix so much. It's too too soft. So let's clean a palette knife. And I should be even cleaning a nice area to mix these colors. More yellow. Uh, this is Barb. I'm just noticing and looking at the the image on my iPhone here. As I look more into the the lighter colors, I can see more of the lighter colors. <laughs> Initially, it just kind of looks whitish, but Isn't if you that... look at it for a while, yeah, yeah you can see more yellows and oranges, and greens peaks. and oranges. Yeah. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's the gift that just keeps on giving with Monet's paintings is you look at them and they're gorgeous and you step up and you start to observe all the gorgeous brush strokes and then you start to observe all the various colors and then you start to observe the various temperatures and the shifts and yeah, I mean, I tell you, it just makes me so, some of my favorite times of being an artist are looking at Monet's paintings. I, you know, and I almost don't want to like him because he's too popular, you know, and everybody loves him and, you know, he's on everybody's, you know, whatever he's, up, you know, his art's used everywhere. You see it all the time, but for, he had some kind of a magic to him or figured something out that was just so neat. And, you know, it's been so such a pleasure to see his work all over the world now. It It's almost like this is painting itself. Like there you go. You're, you're putting, the, nice. the, you're putting the paint down and it's just the reflections in the water. I mean, it's almost, there's movement. There's, there's just color everywhere. I love it. Oh, good. Yeah. I'm having a really good time with it. 
Yeah, when I do these, I've done them, you know, I do a, like one impressionist, really impressionist painting a year. And I have so much fun. I always wonder, why am I not just a, more of an impressionist? I, I love it. What was that second color you just mixed? The, I no, see just the... kind of a straighter pink. So that's more of just the quinacridone and white almost. Okay. Um, I contemplated adding a, an Indian yellow to, just to see, but I, I don't think any of the warms are that warm. They're, it's a pretty cool warm, meaning, you know, it's not hot. It's just warmer. And I think the fact that it's next to the blues is already going to make it feel even warmer than what it looks like on my palette right here. So. Let's have fun. Let's go ahead and paint our sky with a little thicker paint already and see if we can get away with that. All right, bring me back over here. Man, sure to go through the paint fast, though. Are you guys able to see the pinks up there at all? Is it Not, too, Not really. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty washed out. And it's pretty much the same value as the background already. You got to be careful. My brushes get muddy fast because they touch that you know, the wet of the trees, even though they're purples and should have a nice transition. I think I can really play up those peaks if I want to. Oh, I see that pink. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, I made that pink a lot more intense. And why did you do that? I don't know. Maybe just so you can see it on the monitor. <laughs> and I'm going to keep going over it. So that brush is too uh, soft right now. I'm not able to get nice coverage. So I'm going to, and I want to cover a little faster. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, grab a firmer brush here. It's just a big flat, just a nice workhorse of a brush. Um, are you using the same color to do the reflections as you are for the sky? For the most part, yeah. They'll get a little more grayed down when I kind of come in and start finishing areas. But yes, for a large part of this, I am but I'll, I'll neutralize them a little more. I don't want them as vibrant. I use titanium white. It seems like even watching you, it seems to be more pasty feeling um, when you're adding, trying to get a lighter value. Do you find that you need to use more medium when you use a lot of titanium? Um, I haven't used any medium. Um, so um, if, if it's getting too pasty, a lot of times I'll look to the yellow or, you know, what color can I make it? What other color can I add? Um, but, uh, 
Yeah, I, I know what you mean. Um, hopefully this isn't looking too pasty. It's not looking too pasty to me um, on here. So you can just tell your the way the brush seems to be grabbing more. Oh, Not yeah. that it looks pasty. Oh, it's just stickier? Stickier. The yeah. problem is more paint. Yeah, that can definitely happen with some colors. So yeah, I'll, oftentimes I just a touch of paint thinner or medium or whatever if I need it to be a little bit slicker, a little faster. You're using heavier paint in the sky in reflection in the water, right? Then you did uh, yeah, on the back. Right now I'm, I'm, I'm just kind of trusting myself and I want some of the speckling. So I'm actually, yeah, I'm almost treating it like, uh, like I'm painting the Impressionist way now. I'm putting the paint on a lot thicker already. I'm gonna add a touch of the Indian yellow and see because it does feel a little bit cooler than I wanted up in the sky where I want the light to kind of come up, becoming across from the left side a little bit, I believe. Michael, what size is your canvas? 16 inches by 20 inches, or 20 inches by 16, I guess. The original was 32 by 36 and a half. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> that'll be my next challenge. That would be so fun, wouldn't it? Now, but now I'm starting to feel these colors a little more. Like they don't feel so crazy. I don't know if that's just because I've spent more time with them or if by having the whole surface covered. They're still quite colorful, especially for, you know, what I'm used to, but uh, we may be able to come up, come to a happy truce. interesting when you're just kind of copying shapes because in his painting some of these shapes look better but like for me this in my painting this shape here that he's got in this tree back here peeking out looks very lollipop like um, but in his painting it doesn't and I'm trying to figure out what's the difference in our shapes maybe it's just because Monet painted it you it know. looks like the foreground willow is kind of dropping in front of that lollipop tree yeah it definitely will be it'll be intersecting so yeah you're right I should just probably be a little patient and uh trust trust that Monet knew what he was doing here all right let's bring in some detail and texture into this a little bit I'm going to move this over so I'm not stepping in front quite as much hopefully So I'm trying to make a muted green here. It would have been nice to have a big pile of the bluey green that I had used in the trees back there. Letting my brush move around a little bit here. Let's see if I mix some pink with those greens, what happens?
too late. Let's darken them a little bit. Surprised it feels so vibrant still with all the pink I've added to it. I would think that that would have neutralized the green a lot. It's just so nice and abstract. I mean, it's quite liberating. You're not ever really painting a thing at all. It's just, you know, is it lighter? Is it cooler? Is it warmer? Is it... I'm just looking for what's the comparison or even what does I, what would I wish it would be. I'm going to add a little bit of red in there even more. Let's see what that does. Meantime, I start thinking, oh, okay, I'm painting a tree over here. Got to stop. I just, nope, I'm painting a warm, slightly lighter, slightly warmer little passage over here. Slightly cooler, slightly darker, slightly bluer, slightly greener, whatever it is. Passage over here. So what is the rule for painting reflections in water? Is it darker? So the lights get darker and the darks get lighter. They both basically go towards the mid a little bit. Like they both kind of get neutralized a little bit. And that's just a general rule. Um, you know, it can be whatever you're observing, truly. But uh, if you want it to read and you're, you know, in a hurry or half making it up like I am. Yeah, I should definitely. What I find myself doing is like getting off a lot of my most vibrant paint up above and then coming down and kind of doing the reflection, and it seems to be a little less vibrant. Hopefully. I also will paint a lot of my water stuff a little more side to side and up above a little more rounded or up and down seems to also kind of give, you know, just that kind of little bit of like it's laying down flat, you know what I mean? It's a reflection on a flat surface. I'm thinking Monet's met his match. Uh, thank you. That would be uh, uh, the biggest honor ever if uh, anybody. I ever think she's him. right. Well, you're she's very right, sweet, Michael. Both of you. you guys. No, we're just honest. I just need to paint it five times bigger now. The Monet. And get a boat. Do you have a nice big gilded gilded frame for that? I do. It's so crazy and so gorgeous. 
I bought it in Montana or in Wyoming. Um, just happened to be sitting in the back of this gallery, sitting on the floor. It's just this crazy hand carved frame. And I don't know why they had it. You know, I'm sure it was on an old painting and then the people that bought the painting didn't like it because it's so crazy and garish. Um, and I just asked the guy, I'm like, how much is this? And he's like, I don't know, 25 bucks. I was like, sold. It's <laughs> amazing. I'll go grab it here in a little bit, or maybe we can even slam this into it at, towards the end of class and see. But I wanted to, I've, you know, I've wanted to, I know I can't really sell it in a gallery. It's just too crazy and too weird of a frame. Um, and I love it. So I just thought it'd be fun to have something. And I always thought a tonalist painting would look really good in it. Um, and I've actually had a number of paintings just kind of sitting in it as they're waiting their turn to go out to the galleries. But maybe, I don't know, this might be too bright and colorful for it, but also it'd be nice if people just like, oh, that looks like an old Impressionist painting in that old Impressionist frame. All right, so I know that I've got my darks that are going to come back over the top here that are um, the branches hanging down from above. So that's going to be fun. And that's going to help me dissect this space because right now this is a big kind of an awkward almost, uh, I don't know, I almost visualize either a lollipop or an octopus head or something weird. So let's let's get rid of that. And I kind of like a lot of what I've got going on back there already. Um, so I think I, if I can put down some of these darks again, I'm always just kind of going to the next stage, like what, you know, what's going to help me see this painting better? What's going to help me compare my colors? What's going to help me compare my values? And I think having those darks coming further, because the darks actually come quite a ways out. <coughs> so let's so, remix. remix <coughs> darks. Michael, you, you said, um, you know, you paint your darks first, but in this incident, you painted some of your darks first, and now you're yep. going to paint the darks over can you tell me what what prompted that kind of decision yeah absolutely but i can ask you um what was the thing i said after that after darks to lights thin to thick okay and then after that big to small big to small so these darks are going to be smaller shapes so instead of painting around these you know little tiny shapes over and over i can just kind of come back in so it's kind of, you know, it's not like that's an exact order. It's kind of a how, which way makes the most sense. And because I'm painting wet into wet and just building it up, I know that I can, with a really light touch, I shouldn't say I know, I hope, <laughs> I hope that I can come over with a light touch and and put that over the top. But you'll see that I, of course, picked up light paint. So I've got to wipe that away. I'm going to be using a lot of paint here just to do it. So either way could have worked. Um, and maybe that would have worked actually to do more subtractive um, for my sky shapes. But uh, I did it. So now I'm forced, in a way, to just kind of do this. I know that my warm darks will come forward a little more. So I'm bringing some of those up into here. And then I will drag those down across the tops. So it's um it's not a, only in one direction. It's not like once I get my darks down, I can't come back and revisit them. Um, it's kind of, I just want to get as many of them down. So I get my big shapes established because oftentimes my shadows give me my structure. 
and I want to get the structure. Like, what was the underlying structure of this, of uh, these trees? What was the underlying structure of, um, of the design? And, you know, so I, I wanted that. I wanted my big shape so I could get my design. So there's no right or wrong way. I, I guess the main thing I would like you to take away from me doing it this way is that you, you can come back in. You can always do your darks again, you know, especially if they're detail work. Um, I see a lot of my favorite painters will, you know, do from dark to light, and then they come back in at the end, and they're just like, and, you know, a couple of little finesse shadow lines will show you, oh, you know what's going on over here? We've got, this is where the bank meets the water. Just a couple lines will do it for you sometimes. You know what? This is where the bank meets the water. You know, you don't have to draw the whole thing, just a couple dark shadow lines give you that that oomph and that, that uh, base, that foundation. Um, a lot of, yeah, a lot of like the detail and rocks and stuff, the shadows and rocks, I see people come back in and add those later. I want to retrain some of the um, transparency because I want my light to feel like it's getting into these trees and bouncing around inside of them. And then we're seeing some of it, but I also want to have some darker darks, some um, And then I can come right back on top of those and just with a nice and light touch, I can lighten those so it doesn't just feel like a big dark curtain. So that some of the light is getting around these as well. I kind of forgot to paint a whole tree back here. So I'm just going to do it by doing the shadows more. So I didn't want it to just be a big dark mass. So I'm making sure I'm coming through and adding some light into there as well. Hopefully making it interesting and readable. All the while keeping it nice and loose. So do you think Seurat's pointillism really came from Monet or vice versa? I really don't know. I actually don't know the um, the dates of everything. I mean, I know they were working at the same time. Um, I Yeah, that's something uh, I, I don't know. I know that optical mixing, right? 
like where you see all the different colors and you squint your eyes and they blend together and make a, like a new color. Like when you put right. a, a pink next to a green and right beside each other and then you squint your eyes and they make a second color that you didn't even see. Um, so I know that that was a lot, there was a lot of people experimenting with that, um, you know, exploring that and just the vibrancy, you know, and paint colors were just so different and new. So everybody was just experimenting with all these things. So I'm not exactly sure um, who inspired who, or if it was, you know, just they both kind of developed. I don't know. I should know more about that stuff. I guess I have to go back to Paris and um, learn more, which is okay. What a burden to have. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Back to Givernay for me. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, being in Givernay, you know, Monet's home was such a dream. I just would love to get back there mm. and actually spend some time. I want to go look at his flower gardens. Yeah, that's what that's the Giverne. Such a great and amazing thing. I mean, I don't know. You know, it just feels like there's a different energy there. I think he loved that place. He, and when you uh, love the when you love where you live, it knows it, you know? Yeah, and, yeah. <clears throat> and it's just so crazy to just walk around and see his different paintings coming to life in front of you. You know, the path that leads up to his house that was lined with all the flowers or there's a little kid standing there and stuff. And you can just be there in that path. You can stand, you know, along the pond. You can definitely recognize a lot of the pond and lily pad paintings. I mean, of course, the lily pads are all different, but, you know, the trees still feel the same. And Well, he hired gardeners to go in and, and take out some of the lily pads to create a better composition for him yeah yeah otherwise they really clog up um in that park that i was telling you about that's near my house with the forest um there's a two uh lily two waterways that um, have nice bridges and stuff and i always want to paint them and then i always forget until it's too far in the summer and they're just literally covered 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 with lily pads you can't even see the water underneath them and that's not as beautiful as having a couple. So now I'm just, I'm just looking and just having fun. And, you know, I'm half looking at his painting. I'm half kind of making up my own interpretation of it. Um, I'm just having too much fun. And it's pretty liberating. I'm not trying to copy Monet. I'm being inspired by Monet. I'm, uh, you know, I've already modified the shape and the things like that. So I don't feel too guilty. And uh, plus, again, I just have such a bad reference um, to look at that it, in a way, you know, I could gripe and say, you know, oh, it's not going to work out because of the, the uh, bad reference. Or I can use that as a, you know what, I'm free. <laughs> I don't have to copy it. I can't copy it. It would be just a, you know, nobody wants to see a copy, an exact copy of a bad print of a bad photo of a good painting. Um, so I can do my, my best to make it hopefully interesting, at least interesting to me again. It's a painting that I'm going to be keeping if I like it. It's interesting. If you don't like it, I'll buy it for you from you. Yeah, yeah, thanks. thanks. <laughs> I don't know what the, yeah, how much do I got to modify it to sell a Monet copy? <laughs> <laughs> you can give it to me. We'll, I'll give you a tip. There you go. Perfect. perfect. <laughs> I'm joking. I'm joking. No tip for me. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> It's so beautiful. It's really pretty. Thank you. And I, I, I hope you guys are going to have even a third of as much fun as this has been um, for me. And again, I'm having so much fun. And you can tell when somebody's having fun in their paintings, 
And it makes me always wonder, like, why don't I do more Monet painting, or not Monet, more Impressionist paintings? Um, so maybe, maybe you guys are, you know, seeing into the future of where Mike will go with his work eventually. And the cool thing is, is, you know, I'm so much about glow and atmosphere and everything else. And I've maybe kind of gotten myself in a little bit of a trap by doing the really transparent and uh, kind of the wiping away stuff maybe is working against me right now because maybe I should just be leaning towards still trying to capture glow and atmosphere and everything else, but leaning in towards the more impressionistic, thicker paint, a little more free. Michael, this is kind of a really generic, and I don't know if you can answer this question, but what do you think really creates atmosphere? I mean, how how would you describe it? I always think of it as just air, you know, but I know that's yeah. not true. Well, it, I mean, it is air, and it's the light passing through air. You know, it's the water vapors. Atmosphere can be done by dust. It can be done by water. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if it's sunrise, it's generally water vapor. Um, in the evenings, it's a lot of times it's more dust, and that's why you get a little more of that gold feel sometimes. Um, so, yeah, it's it's literally light passing through particulates in the air or passing around even. A lot of times it's the particulates. Like, um, you know, we've all unfortunately got to see too many fires in the last number of years. And, you know, it, it almost makes you feel guilty when you step outside and you're like, oh, my gosh, that's the most beautiful sunset. Um, and it's all those, uh, all that ash and everything else in the sky makes such warm, golden um, sunsets. Um, it's funny, though, because I love to paint them and go out and look at them. But they are, I think, right now, with so many fires and with the, you know, global warming and everything else, it's affecting people. Like, they, they used to buy them, and now people are just like, look at them, like, oh, that reminds me of a fire. And it's got a worse connotation. So that's kind of an interesting thing I've been observing in how people respond to my paintings. But yeah, when you're out and you're seeing the atmosphere, I think it's kind of good to start asking some of those, you know, almost more scientific questions of, uh, you know, what is it? Is that water vapor that's in the way there? You know, is it fog, clouds, haze? Um, is it, uh, or is it dust? Is it smoke? Is it, and they all will affect it. I mean, sometimes LA, you know, with all its smog and everything can really get some gorgeous, interesting, soft, atmospheric sunsets. Oh, and Somebody even posted that on our group, I thought, on the Padlet page about um, a lot of the old atmospheric and precious paintings were probably due to the coal smoke in the cities, I believe. Even here in the desert in, in the morning at this time of year, in the fall and winter, we have uh, a lot of dew falls in, uh, at night. Oh, so we don't get a lot of rain all, the, all year long like the rest of the world, but we get a lot of dew in the morning and it'll be so heavy, it drips off the side of the house. So it makes a, a hazy, misty at the base of the mountains around us. Mm -hmm. And it's just beautiful. And then in the evening, the sun dries everything up all day. And in the evening, I see dust flying. Then it's dusty. And the dust is like a brownie, tan, smoky, yellow looking color. It's hard to describe. And it's all around the base of the mountain. And then you can see these whirlwinds of dust just flying across the farmer's fields and stuff. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. There's, I mean, there's just, yeah. There's beauty everywhere if you're just, you know, willing to look for it and observe and, you know, we get used to a certain kind of beauty, like wherever you live, you know, for me, I'm so, I so love green and so love the, the fog and the haze that we get here in the Pacific Northwest. And it takes me a little while when I get to like a deserty area or somewhere else to start to appreciate the beauty that's there and just different than our type. Um, 
and the lighting effects and everything else. Sometimes I can see the, mount Go ahead. the mountains. Go ahead. Sometimes Sorry. I can see see the mountains that are sixty miles away, and sometimes I can't. So right. that's how that's how bad the the haze and the dust can get. I'm sorry. I apologize. No, no, no. Right now I'm feeling like this may have been too big of a jump getting to this light, even though in my reference, it feels like it's really light in there. But I've got to, again, since I'm making kind of turning this into my own image, you know, I'm just seeing, you know, how much can I get away with in my own comfort level now, I've kind of gone away from trying to mimic as much as possible to um, interpreting more and more. And now not even interpreting it, but really kind of making it my own, hopefully. I like that cobalt teal and white with the touch of that other blue in it. It's nice. You know, when I look, this looks busy, and I'm wondering if I just kind of bound them together maybe a little more and didn't have so many separations of the values, light, dark, light, dark, light, dark, but more just maybe like the transitions like I needed going into the sky. You are going to post this so we can see it better, aren't you? <laughs> sure, if I can photograph it, it'll be really shiny because how thick the paint is. Okay. <laughs> but yeah, I'll try my best for sure. Yeah, I need to go through and post all the paintings. I realize I hadn't posted any of the homework or the, you know, uh, things we've been doing. Um, I do have to confess, I did wipe off two of them. Um, I see one of them right now. Yeah, this one that we did, I actually just went back right after class and wiped it back off. Um, and then the other one that I did with it, um, just because I wanted a second chance. Second chance at them. And I should have done that while, I was, while the video was rolling so you guys could see. But that's the nice thing about having the underpainting. Is I literally just wiped it all off of the whole day's painting. Um, just so I could try again. And I really like that ability. Great. Well, I am going to get a little bit crazy here and uh, add some of the light reflections in the water and see if, um, you know, it might not need too much, too much more. Um, I don't want to overwork it too much. Um, unless you guys are seeing anything really obvious that I'm missing any spots in the painting, like a whole tree that I forgot over here. Um, how's that looking to you guys? He says only half fishing for compliments. You know, when I get up close to the screen, I'm like, I, I, I feel like, oh God, that's just a bunch of strokes. And I pull myself back and I'm going, oh my goodness, this is just stunning. And that's what I see also. I see that too. When I'm squinting at the screen, looking at every stroke he's making, and then I step back and I go, oh, wow. Yeah, and that's the thing. Uh, one of my very favorite art memories with my daughter was um i i don't know how old for sure uh, between three and five so let's just say she was four um we were at the portland art museum and they happened to have one of monet's big lily paintings you know great big one um probably easily you know five foot by or bigger and uh you know it was kind of roped off but you could still get within a foot of it and she was looking at it and loving it. And then all of a sudden, she just, you know, turns to, and there's a whole crowd of people there looking at it. And she turns to him. It's like, it's just a mess. 
<laughs> and then she jogs back a little bit and goes, it's beautiful, it's lilies, and then jogs back up and goes, it's just a mess, and just kept doing that. And it was just so fun to see her realizing that on her own, that it was, you know, exactly what it is. It's just chaos. It's just, you know, when you get up close to a Monet's paintings, they just look like a, somebody threw confetti at the painting surface. And then when you step back, it all comes together. Our eyes make something out of that. And yeah, I just, I mean, I try to retain some of that in my painting. Like most of my paintings are a little on the messier side when you get really up close to them. But, uh, you know, nothing like the true impressionists were doing. You know, in fact, you know, if you see like a, one of my paint, bigger paintings and you see a small thumbnail of it on the computer, people will be like, oh my gosh, it looks like a photo. Um, but if you actually saw the original up close, you know, it's just a lot messier than that. Um, I keep getting sidetracked here. All right, I'm gonna grab this and I'm gonna go ahead and soften some of these brush strokes down here just a little bit. I'm just gonna drag, especially kind of along the periphery of the trees and the water in the reflection of the sky. You should have a paint. Uh, I'm just softening that so it looks a little more, this is being a little bit lazy. I should probably mix these colors but instead I'm just kind of dragging. Um, I have a question, Michael, it's Michelle. Yeah, Michelle. Um, so at this point, doing something like this that has a lot of juicy brush strokes, how do you resist the urge to smooth it out? <laughs> you ask while I'm smoothing it out. Um, yeah, totally. It, it, I have to, you know, fight that constantly. And when I'm out plain air painting, I do, I smooth it out so often. And usually I kind of regret it, um, but it's kind of a safety net for me. And, um, and uh, so I, I, yeah, I have to fight that. It's like my, oh, it's not working out. It's not working out. I'll just smooth it out. And, you know, all of a sudden it'll look purposeful. Um, but, you know, with this one, it was literally about the brushwork and the color and the broken color. So if I just smoothed it out, then, you know, I would lose that. So, you know, maybe it's important that I, when I don't want to do it, I just set a rule, not a rule. I just set a, in, an, an intention, a painting intention for that day's painting that, uh, that um, I'm not going to smooth it out. I'm going to make myself mix the colors or, you know, do as closely as I can to what I'm after. But then I, I smooth out way too often, Michelle. Um, and I sometimes feel like it becomes a, yeah, I almost feel like I'm giving up sometimes when I do that. But only when I kind of wish I wasn't. Ah, does that make sense? Yeah, sometimes I'm sure it, it ends up um improving it in the way that you want but yeah I, I guess if if uh if me as a you know student just decides this is a practice I'm doing this experiment and just I'm just gonna leave the brush strokes showing then like you said the intention is is gonna be if I I won't take it too seriously yeah yeah exactly um and yeah, you're right. And sometimes, yeah, blending it, sometimes blending it or softening the edges and stuff is absolutely the right thing to do. You know, maybe I will look at this after class and yeah, maybe I will soften the edges down around the corners because I know that that brings the attention in a little more um, towards the center. But that's not, you know, what Monet's doing, at least in this instance, even though I do know that he definitely had some very unrefined corners and some of his paintings that are just so beautiful with the abstraction and everything else that he's getting into them. Um, so, yeah. And the good thing, Michelle, and everybody is if you do want to, you know, blend it down a little bit, do it, and then just come back in and add paint on top again. You know, you'll just have a different kind of an underpainting, a little bit different of an underpainted feel. So, you know, if you find yourself doing it or you just can't help yourself, that's all right. Just keep building it up until you get a texture and a surface 
that you're happy with and only that's you know that's completely up to you for me the challenge is because i feel like i paint so thinly so often my challenge is to when i show this to my wife <laughs> to have her go oh good you used paint she likes it when there's texture on my paintings and uh Maybe because she grew up in Europe. Maybe because she just knows the struggles I share with her about the painting not quite working out or me whistling, whistling out a little bit and smushing things out a little too often. I've noticed that you're really uh, careful about lining up your reflections mm -hmm. um so i'm gonna <laughs> i'm gonna point out that the um that backward that back tree to me and i don't know if maybe it's the angle no i think you're right yeah <laughs> you're right yeah and it's because i'm standing to the side it in the yeah. moment right in front of it so i gotta okay what i'm gonna do is, that's good and this will give me an opportunity so if i came down it's right there. So this whole part of the tree needs to go, basically, it looks like to me. Yeah. Does that feel better on that side, ignoring the other side of the tree? Yeah, except the angle. Except for the angle, yeah. Let's see now. So now i got to mix up some of these colors. That top is what's going to be important. That's better. A little better. Yeah. And yeah, I'll have to probably fix up some of these things as I... Uh, can step back without the camera right in the front of it. Um, but let's just see what happens if I knock in a couple of these light passages in the water, and then I'm going to call this painting done for today. Thanks, Michael. I have to leave for an appointment. Yeah, well, it was absolutely my pleasure. This was super fun for me. So thanks for giving me an excuse to, to do it and have a great uh, afternoon.
All right, well, I'm going to go ahead and stop for now so I can get some fresh eyes on it and um, everything else. But I really, really had fun. I hope you guys have a great uh, time with your uh, black and white um, acrylic painting. If you decide to do that, uh, or with your impressionist style, Monet, how's that look? Is that too shiny? Too shiny. T turn off the light. I can't. It's hard to see the. Oh, perfect. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, that's with no light. My studio is dark right now. That's just a little bit of ambient light. Look like two there. different paintings. Right. Yeah. I like this. It's beautiful. See if I open these blinds. Beautiful orange like, day. Does that make any difference? The sky is gorgeous and the water. Oh, everything is beautiful, Michael. Thank you. Yeah, well, sorry you can't see the, you know, little intricacies of the color switches and stuff inside of the, of everything. Um, but uh, I will get a photo of it here soon and uh, everything else. Um, yeah, we have a five or 10 more minutes. Um, we can uh, switch over to this camera. Hey. <laughs> um, we can uh, go and look at the Padlet if uh, one or two of you have um, would like a critique today, uh, just because we kind of, sorry, used up a lot of class, but two paintings, so, so let's share yeah. screen. Thank you, Michael, Super, super class. class. Thank you. I have right. to go, just Absolutely. review the homework, um, a black and white, and then a impressionistic type painting. Yeah, yeah, and you don't have to do the black and white if you don't want to, but I, you know, since you seem to uh, have some questions about it, you might want to do, and you can make it as simple, you know, as you want. There's some references right. in there that are really simplistic, um, whatever you'd like. Well, thank you so much. You did well and communicated this clearly. I like when you tell your reasoning behind doing certain steps and strokes. Thank you for a wonderful, informative lesson. My au revoir. <laughs> I'm being Monet. Au revoir. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Does anybody have okay. any good questions? Yeah. Michael, this is Brenda Siegel. Um, I was not in class the day you started doing critiques. Would you be able to do one or two of mine? Sure. Is uh, the pink one here? Sure. All right. Let me see. There you are. All right. Very nice. Yeah, I went in and uh, commented a little bit, but yeah, definitely. I think this, uh, you took a kind of complicated scene and even made it more complicated and it really worked out for you. It's really nice um, by adding that bright pink into this, uh, this design. So tell me a little bit, you, it looks like this is one of the ones you started as a wipe away. Yes, and I tried to duplicate that brilliant pink by making my own color out of the quinacquinone red and I think a little bit of alizarin crimson and white. Oh, interesting. Yeah, I would think the alizarin would make it more mellow. Yeah. Oh, no, it was um, rose. It was a rose color. Oh, okay. With a touch of quinacridone and white. Very nice. Well, I sure reads in here. I mean, that looks really colorful and vibrant. Um, yeah, nice. Um, yeah, I like this. Um, I think, you know, some of your brush strokes could be brought together a little tighter. I think it's kind of spotty feeling a little bit. Um, that's kind of up to you. That's almost a, a stylistic thing. Um, and then also, um, with the trunks of the trees, you're going to want them to get thinner as they go further from the ground. Mm -hmm. So like this, as it comes down, gets um, kind of thicker. This one gets, you know, definitely kind of thicker feeling as it gets up towards the top, almost right at the end of it. So if you can, and oftentimes when this happens to me, you know, it's hard to make really fine marks. 
you almost have to come back in with the dark one more time and just kind of make it thin again or take a Q-tip or whatever and pick up a little bit of it. Um, yeah, I really like this piece. I had trouble with the wipe away method. I think the surface I was using, I had um, gessoed some yeah, can... boards and it just sucked up the paint. So I really, by the time I got ready to wipe away, it didn't really wipe away that much. Okay, yeah, good to know. And I can definitely see like the texture of your gesso strokes underneath it and stuff. So yeah, it may have just been, you know, and some gessos are just thirstier than others. I definitely, definitely find that. Um, so I'm always experimenting with, you know, different surfaces, different um, gesso. So that's where I've kind of gotten to the birch panel with the, um, is it Liquitex? I can't remember the name of it. The gesso that I use um, seems just right. Or maybe I've just gotten used to it. You know what I mean? Sometimes you just go, okay, I've got like three minutes to attack this. And, you know, and I got to be done in about 15 minutes or 10 minutes because it'll just get too thirsty. Um, and I'll, I also find if I wipe too many areas, it gets kind of mushy and muddy. And I'm just pushing the paint, you know, down into that gesso. Um, so, yeah, something I've definitely learned. Nice I job on the design. Nice job on the colors. Um, yeah, um, it does appear that you have two light sources because this makes me think that the sun is just setting back behind here. This vibrant, vibrant color. And then the tree trunks make me feel like the sun is to the left and striking mm -hmm. this side. So you probably don't need those highlights. I know those are in the photo. Um, so yeah, when I did it, I don't know if you remember, I was doing that same thing. And I went, oh no, my lights to my left. I got to change my clouds and make them look like they're also lit to the left. And which is probably why I wiped the painting off at, at the end of the class. Um, as I just hadn't made, I hadn't made these smart choices. I hadn't questioned it properly before I started it. And I posted mm. the photo before I added oh, the paint. <laughs> yes, the yeah, that one there, um, which was, that was kind of in process. Just the wipe away, yeah. And then is this all the same image? No, ones? no, that's a different one. That one, I posted the, the wipe <laughs> away, and then I went over it with the heavier paint, and it was just mud to mud. It was just getting so worse. This was the first one, and then it went to that? Yes. That's a little interesting, yeah, because I actually really like it at this stage, which is always the danger about the wipe away method. I, you know, I like the dark upper paint, upper sky, and um, I think um, you are attracted to detail. Yes. Um, and, you know, the spindly branches um, can definitely get you in trouble. You see how they almost become distracting when they're kind of all over the place? Mm -hmm. Um, becomes kind of really busy and they're competing with the spindliness of the grasses and stuff here. So a lot of times when I've got like lots of interesting branches and stuff, I either make the painting kind of about that, about the, you know, the detail of the branches and stuff, or I simplify it and just let them have leaves or, you know, whatever else. Um, I don't do too, too many um, of these. A little bit will do you. Just a couple of them will really feed into the idea of detail. Same thing with your grasses. Um, look for the shapes that they're making and, you know, the kind of blurring your eyes a little bit at it, simplifying them a little bit um, is generally going to be a little better than having, you know, a whole bunch of little skinny independent grasses. Um, it just looks kind of spotty and a tiny bit distracting. I totally get what you're after. And I have to, I do this all the time in my painting, all, all, all the time, like most every painting I do. And then I actually come back into the painting and simplify it a little bit, kind of wiping them away and everything else. What I'm telling you though there, Brenda, is completely a matter of taste. My best friend would like your painting, so, this painting so much better than how I would finish it because he likes all the detail and he likes all the, you know, the um, interesting little things in the paintings. Whereas for me, it becomes kind of busy and kind of loses the big story mm -hmm. sometimes. So I yeah, should I really throw like away all my little brushes. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I, I definitely, um, I, I definitely uh, 
hesitate with the little brushes or I'll use them at the end. Um, just move that out of the way there. Um, yeah, very nice. And I, I gotta, I gotta ask you about this. Is this based on a another painting by somebody else? Uh, no, that was um, trying to do the um, limited palette. That was in the, I think, the second class. And this is from one of your own references. Uh, no, it's from. Um, hmm. I'll have to look back to see who the reference was from. But it's not a painting, it's from a photo? Yes. Mm -hmm. ah, it's interesting. It really reminds me of a painting I saw when I was in um, in France. And I just, was, I spent a long time looking at it. And I actually tried to look up the painting, but I had no idea what the artist's name was. So unfortunately, I couldn't find it. But I really like this. I think it is so interesting and kind of expressionist in a way. Um, anyway, I really like it. Um, so I was very curious about it. Like, yeah, how did you come up with the idea of the cools and stuff? The clouds are warm. The outline of the clouds is cool. And then this little bright, warm, I guess, sailboat? No, that's a, um, like a buoy. Oh, it's taken, okay. taken on a lake. Gotcha. So just like a buoy light in the distance, a red marker. Yeah. I really, it looks like it's being kind of backlit by the, the moon there. Um, anyways, I really like this painting. I think it's really interesting. And uh, yeah, very nice. Thank you. Yep. Anybody else have a quick question before we head out? I do. All right, Shelly. I'd like, like to know if, uh, how you would, or if you think this is finished, but for me, I really wanted the, uh, the sunset to be <laughs> the focal point. That's it. Okay. I, it's really hard to photograph these and get the actual color because it's not as vivid as this. Okay, yeah. Yeah, I understand that. Um, I'm just kind of like letting my eye relax and seeing how it moves and where it goes through this painting. And so a painting can be about a thing like it doesn't have to be about a point like you know you're saying like the focal point you know if it's about the sunset then this sunset's this huge thing right um so and it, that it is kind of what it's about like it's about this marsh at sunset or this creek at sunset um so you've captured that the colors are gorgeous in your sky your transitions really nice and uh feels fairly convincing going from this really warm to this vibrant blue you know even though it may not be so blue in real life or as orange um nice and you did a good job of making it look like there's a hill versus a crooked painting um, <laughs> <laughs> um by kind of flattening this out and uh flattening out the line back here looks like you kind of straightened up some of your trees a little bit too somehow um yeah i think it i think it works i think this is a gorgeous transition colors in here really nice and soft um my only complaint is this, these lines right here, they, they drew draw a lot of attention. Like I know what you're doing. I know why they're there, but it just feels busy and it, it draws my attention unnecessarily, I think. Okay. Um, that's again, that's just a matter of taste. I think your grasses in the foreground are really quite nice. Um, and your tree shapes are great little hints of warmth as the light's kind of getting in and bouncing around inside of them. Um, the shape is really solid. It could be, you know, a little possibly broken up. It almost looks structural. Okay. Um, but that's, that's pretty minor. Yeah, what do you guys think? Does this look like it's a painting about a sunset? <laughs> what kind of brush did you use for I, the grasses? Well, the, okay. foregr the foreground. I got uh, I have a texture brush and then I used in the foreground. Um, I used a, what is it? It's like a, a rigger. And then I have the chip brushes, which I got, yay. Hey, all right, chop those out, have fun with them. So I sort of just pulled it over to try and 
lengthen them out and make them a little more soft. So I did that in the background and then just kept building. Great, yeah. The, the foreground so, ones are a rigger brush? Yeah. A rigger and then I went over them with the, a chip brush. Just to soften them a touch. Yeah. Yeah, I use the riggers a lot, especially like in those cattails that I was just doing where I showed you the black. I just used a big watercolor rigger brush. Um, I had to kind of twist it because sometimes yeah. it gets sort yeah. of stuck. <laughs> That's a really good description, Shelly. Yeah, it's a pull when you do it, a pull and a twist. Um, if you try to do it like a pencil, it won't make the right marks. But you have to remember to kind of push down and then slowly have less pressure. And so you get those points at the end. I also flip it upside down and I flip the painting, the reference upside down so I can get the movement. Mm -hmm. Are really beautiful. Thank yeah, you. Played. I think it's lovely. Yeah. Thank you. I think it's lovely too. Yes, it's very pretty. All very, right. Very Anybody else here? I, I have <clears throat> just a quick question, Michael. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I posted one early this morning. Uh, it's that smoky um, clouds that we had at the fire a couple of years back. And I changed the foreground from the from my reference photo and made it cooler and i was wondering if you thought that should stay warm or become cool i have to say by just looking at the two of them like this really really small i actually like the green otherwise it's just orange okay. brown on top of brown right i think that that was a smart yes. choice this makes sense, you know, that looks like the time of year that the fires would come. But uh, I like, I do have to say, I like your choice here uh, more. All right. Um, just because it okay. does have a separation, but yet you've got a lot of the warmth showing through underneath. So it's still relating. You know what I mean? Like there's a definite okay. harmony, not a huge separation. It's not like a cold, cold green or, you know, too, too strong. Um, be careful with your white here. Um, it's just kind of losing the feel. So th these need probably a little more color in them. No, yeah, I think I understand okay. what you're doing, but I, it feels they feel separate of the thing that they are on, the big smoke. Yeah, and then I kind of I, I forgot to deal with the right upper corner because I, I wiped off what was on there. So that's just kind of... <laughs> Sure. Um, candle. It's, there. it's so weird what smoke does, how it lights and how the light goes inside of the clouds and moves around and bounces. And it's reflecting off all that ash and all those particulates. And it just does the weirdest things. I don't know if you guys ever like put like a tangerine or an orange that's been sliced into the window and let it catch mm -hmm. the light from you know outside and it's just amazing how the light just bounces around within it um smoke does the mm -hmm. same thing when it's lit properly um really strange it's, it's so crazy because yeah. it's so gorgeous and it's so eerie and haunting at the same time yeah um but yeah Thank if you. we look here I, I see what you were trying to do with the white but yeah it's definitely not mm -hmm. a white line by any means okay so, when I do that, I'll, you know, I, I'll do the that. same thing where I lighten it up. You just use that as a note for yourself. You know, to, this needs to be a little lighter, but not whiter. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. And that's about seeing okay, how about the colors. Yep, my pleasure. Anybody else? One more. All right, you guys are easy. All right, Linda, it was nice to, uh, I posted a bunch of yours there. Um, and somebody would ask about if there's a story to the boatman here. Yes, that's my grandfather, my mother's oh, father. Cool. And he was a Daniel Boone kind of character. He, he um, hunted and trapped, and he had a very large family, and he made the P-Rub that he's standing in. And mm -hmm. he, would, he always oh. lived across the bayou. And when we went to visit, we had, he would leave three or four P-Rubs on the on the roadside where the of the bayou so we could get to his house 
So different people, you know, people would come and visit so they get in the pirogue and go across the bayou. But he fished and he hunted and he trapped and I'm gonna come back in and put some fog and mist in there because sometimes there would be mist on the water and snakes coming down out of the moss in the trees and falling in the boat and scaring the the jeepers <laughs> out of me. <laughs> yeah. Panthers would be screaming and echoing on that water. Oh my God, it was so scary. That's so fun. So um, are there photos that you're painting from or is this all memory based? Well, it's memory and it's from a photo that my first cousin had and she, my uncle has a birthday next month in March and she asked me to paint from it. But this one, I just made up the bayou scene kind of where he lived, where one time, he lived in different places along this Bayou Rouge, it was called. And um, it was very, um, mm -hmm. I don't know, it, it interconnected with water canals that led to the Atchafalaya River in, the, in Louisiana. And this was in the back of his house. And it's like all moss hanging in the trees. You know, I, I, plant, I love to paint cypress trees with moss hanging in them, because that's what I grew up playing with, mm -hmm. you know? That's so cool. Um, yeah, I love the memory. And I love everything, what you got going on here. Um, the figure, if you care, if it's, yeah, you know, you can totally feel a tiny bit stiff or mannequin-like. Um, yeah, how do I soften him? So, you, um, so you, is the reference photo of him kind of standing like that in the boat? Yeah, he he sometimes he stood with his foot on the side of the pirogue. And when we kids got in the boat, in the little boats, you felt like you were going to tip it over. But he had such balance. Hmm. He would sit on a four-legged chair on the back two legs <laughs> with his feet sticking out. Wow. That, I mean, that's... and. In one of the photos, his foot is on the side of the pirogue, and it's still he's still upright. He's not in the water. <laughs> uh, that's amazing. What, yeah, what I, did you I call know. what you call that boat? A pirogue. It's P I G O. I don't. I can't even. It's P I G R E O U. And he made several styles of them, and he would carve them out of a cypress log. Wow. Or oak log. He would use, you know. It didn't matter what kind of wood he used. They were, they all floated beautifully, all handcrafted. And this is, this was like sometime in some place along the uh, bayou where he lived, um, there were just moss just covering. You couldn't even see daylight. So this is, and the cypress trees, there's different kind of cypress trees and they all grow together happily. You know, and I started fogging it a little bit, but I wanted it to dry more. And now I'm gonna go back and do it. That's really fun. And I think I might put a bird in it, like an egret or something. I might, I don't know. Well, but I love I, that you're doing those. I don't want to, you know, critique it very much, but yeah, you just for some but reason. Tell me about tell me about is. grandpa. How how can I make him softer? Well, I was going to say, you know, getting a reference or, you know, taking photos of somebody, you know, in that stance kind of a lot of times yeah. when I, this goes back to my illustration days, you know, when I needed figures doing different things, I would, you know, just run around with my camera and have my friends do posing and stuff. Like when I did a book on Lewis and Clark and stuff, all my friends became all the, you know, party of Lewis and Clark and mm -hmm. everybody else just, um, so I just kind of, you know, you take photos. I don't know in this one, he looks a little better. I think in the other one, it might just be merely his uh, really wide, wide shoulders. Almost looks okay. like he's got pads underneath. So I think you can kind of. I can solve it. Those. But otherwise, I mean, I think it looks nice and it tells such a nice story and stuff. I'm hesitant to critique it too much. And I definitely well, don't. don't don't worry about that critique it. I don't care. I'm, gi okay. I'm giving it to my uncle. I want it to be really nice. Sure, sure. Yeah, it's his, um, it's his shoulders in this. Um, okay. Yeah, and yeah, I think so, at least. And there were right. always grape vines. You know what, the muscadine, the muscadine grapes, they grow wild in Louisiana, and they were always crawling up the cypress trees, and we would shake the, the vines and sometimes swing on them out over the bayou when they were right, the cypress trees were right over, right next to the water. 
and fall out in the water, fall out and oh, go man. swimming in Are the water. Are there like crocodiles and everything else, alligators or whatever's there? Oh yeah. We yeah, we crawled on the alligator um how a uh, nest when she had babies. She didn't ever eat us. We're all here. We all survived. I don't know how <laughs> we did that. I have no idea. Uh, Sandra, are you oh here? Are you able to find, uh, sign in? Yeah, I'm here. Um, yeah, I know we haven't. I've never had a chance to talk to you about your paintings, I don't think. Would you like to talk about your newest painting at all? Sure. <laughs> um, great. Let's just do that. And then I'm going to, this will be our final one here. So, oh, nice. You did kind of a. That's the close up. That's a close up of it. Okay. The Is other ones. Active and then additive on top. Yep. Yeah, the, the, the go one down below is before it. The, mm -hmm. the oh. subtractive. Yep. Yeah, that was it right there. That's so yeah. interesting. Look at that transition. Wow. Very cool. So, yeah, I mean, I can see like, you know, you're missing whole parts of your trees and everything else. And uh, what did you think of just doing this as your initial kind of way of working in your values? Very messy. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I got all over my computer screen because I do this while you're while you're doing it. Oh, man. Did you do that today? <laughs> no, I do it when you did it before. Oh, I do okay. it I do it during class, so I had to hurry and try, and I got all over the computer too. <laughs> well, I, I like is it, and it is it the same one? Like the, you just stuck with this and made that yep. into this. Wow. That's the same one. Nice. Well, great there's job. Part, see, like, I don't like the trees. <laughs> I don't like this dark part along, like in the middle here. Yeah, right there. I don't like that. I need to do something with that, and I don't like the trees. They wound up in a row and these here in the middle yeah yeah it is pretty equally spaced um so yeah with the darks if you want this to be shadow which is going on in the photo the reference photo which again is not a good reference photo so you got to make stuff up but um so i know what you're looking at um is uh shadows so if you want it to be shadows in your painting then just cooling them down it's a really warm dark that you have here which makes it look like burnt earth, like, you know, when you used to do field burning, it kind mm -hmm. of has that appearance. So if we lit, lit it up a little bit, made it a little bit blue-green, it'll look like it's in shadow. But yeah. otherwise, it's kind of up to you. You can literally put grass on top of it or yeah. whatever you want, you know, green or whatever color. Um, yeah, I agree that, like, having one of these trees missing, like, I think this one would make mm -hmm. it a little more interesting of a shape. But you know, I wouldn't worry about it too much. I would probably just fix this dark area and then move on to your next painting. I think yeah. that, you know, every painting we're learning, we're, uh, you know, experimenting. I don't usually want uh, people to, to linger on any of them too much because you're going to learn just as much from things that don't quite work out. Um, if, I, if I let it dry, will I be able to get that same orange color if I go over that bush? It'll be tough because it's transparent underneath oh see that oh. transparency so you what you would end up doing is mixing a close color and then you probably end up having to paint it over quite a few areas mm, so that's so one of the drawbacks when you end up yep. leaving a lot of the transparent color underneath so it won't look right then if i go over it not unless you paint over the top of it with you'll probably you can try it i mean why not you know um and then and then see if you end up having to put whatever color you put here will probably have to kind of go over your clouds as well. Mm -hmm. My favorite parts are the birch trees, the sky, and the little reflection in the water. Mm -hmm. Those are my favorite parts. And then the foreground I like too. So Yeah, it's really nice. I think this could probably cool down, touch a little more as well. Um, yeah, the, that's what drew me in. That's why I wanted to make sure I had a chance to talk to you is, when I saw this, I was like, oh, that's so beautiful. And it looks like a pastel painting, a really nice pastel painting with these, uh, how you did your brush marks. And I love the little bits of warmth that are still showing through because it doesn't feel like such a huge jump. It feels like the clouds and the sky are related. Um, yeah, really electric, but not like so electric that it looks fake. Um, nicely done. And yeah, nice sense of detail in your trees. Um, 
if I were to, you know, critique it or ask much, it would be the darkness here. And then mm -hmm. I would also ask, where is your light source? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, because yeah, your trees don't seem to be lit or, you know, that like there's not a shadow side or a light side. Yeah, um, it looks like the sun's coming from behind. So I don't know. Yeah, a little bit. So that, that would be my only like critiques. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I would probably want to do something with one of these trees, or I would even just make even a couple more trees. Um, so it's a little more, so it's not just dot, dot, dot. Maybe if you even made like these two trees connected, mm -hmm. that would feel a little more irregular. So it'd be like tree space, tree space, big three tree wide space, mm -hmm. kind of something. <laughs> It's you want some kind of an irregularity generally. Right. Very cool. What if, what if I put like a, a different color bush like in between one of them? So it looks yeah, but like I wouldn't want to put it right in between. I definitely want it like overlapping or something. Uh-huh. Um so it looks more forward or maybe a lighter color or or yeah, I mean just a slightly different color or yeah, it's yeah. So yeah, that would be like my note to you would be like, where's your light source? Because on this tree, it feels like maybe the light's coming from the left and this is yeah. the shot. Yeah, that's what I was thinking of doing was from the left, but. But that's the only thing that really feels like that in the painting. Right. Everything oh. else seems like it's coming from behind. Yeah, I would say so. I would say so. So anyways, I would say, you know what? mission accomplished if you want to do much i would just paint over that dark spot and if you want to add a bush or something do it but i wouldn't spend much more time i would say you know what you learned a lot you had some nice winds in this uh the colors are beautiful and everything else and uh move on okay yeah better to it's have you ever heard the uh, the story of 50 pounds get you an a no have you ever heard that no so the as the story goes, there's a, um, a pottery teacher who splits the class in half on the very first day of class. And he tells the left side of the class, he's like, you guys are graded on one bowl, your best bowl for the class. The other side of the class, you guys are graded on if you can do 50 pounds of uh, thrown pots. Right. And so the story goes that, you know, one side sitting and thinking and analyzing and perfecting and the other side is just throwing pots and throwing pots and throwing pots and throwing pots and just learning and changing and growing as they go because every pot they're learning a little bit more. And um, so that the, the story is, is that at the end, the people who did 50 pounds of pots were much better at making pots and had much prettier pots because they were taking chances. They were just making and making and making. And I think that that's really important when we're starting off painting. I, I, I one time when I was teaching at Clark College, I had a, a student who for two terms worked on this painting and she was so proud of herself. And she just kept telling me, I never give up. I never give up. And oh, I would just tell her, please give up on this painting, not on painting, <laughs> but give up on this painting because she was just not learning and fixing is not fun. Painting is fun. So okay. you know what? on the time that I spend sometimes fixing a painting, I could spend weeks fixing a painting that I only would have taken me hours to repaint. And yeah. so that, and painting is much more pleasurable. Yeah. Okay. Um, before, before you go, um, there's just something a little off subject, but something that I seen on a video of um, another painter, he, they were doing plein air. Mm -hmm. There was like five people all painting the same thing. And I, and I just loved it how they showed everybody's paintings because everybody see, interprets the painting so different. So every painting uh, was completely different. Oh uh, yeah, it is. Yeah, that's one of my favorite things too. I'm lucky that a um, number of my good friends are playing our painters and we go out sometimes up to about six, seven, eight of us. And yeah, it's amazing how we'll literally be sitting, like our easels are almost touching so that we can you know pass the wine easily back and forth. And uh, how amazingly different our paintings will be and how, you know, yeah, it's crazy. I love it. So yeah, great observation. And then it's fun in class. That's why I don't mind having students even, you know, use references I bring in and stuff because you're all bringing your own 
story to it. Like you're the only person that turned them into birch trees. <laughs> awesome. Well, all right. Uh, I'm going to do stop share. And thank you guys so much for your time and for staying extra long, three and a half hours. That's a lot of it's a lot of time to spend uh, listening to my gravelly voice. So I appreciate it. And um, yeah, you guys have a great week. I look forward to your messy, fun, um, impressionist paintings. Thank you, Michael. Okay. Thank All you, right, Michael. Guys. Bye. Take care, everybody.